And welcome to a, another YouTube watercolor tutorial. I am Andrew Broussard. I have an 11 by 15 quarter sheet of Stonehenge Aqua. I just um, tore the big old sheet up just now, so I'm ready to get painting. Um, if you're new to the channel or new to videos, or um, maybe this is your second or third video that you've watched, um, I usually spend the first, let's say, four or five minutes. I soak my paper in this fashion. I then talk about um, my palette a little bit and maybe some ideas that I plan to approach. So if you are um, used to my spiel about how I set up and whatnot, feel free to jump ahead about like, I guess four or five minutes. Um, but if you want to stay and hear about the palette and maybe my ideas for today, um, you can hang back with me. We'll see what's going on. So with the paper, use my Stonehenge, uh, sorry, my, my Hake. This is a medium size Ron Ranson Hake. Got it from Cheap Joe's Art Stuff. Um, this brush has been going strong for a long time. This is definitely at least a year old that I've had this brush and I've used it on every, almost every watercolor painting I've done since then. Um, I use a butcher pan with my uh, palette and I like to wipe it off in the beginning just to kind of clear the middle. Recently I had put a splotch of um, white gouache there. And I talked about it in the last video about how that gouache can um, kind of contaminate the paint around it because of that chalkiness. Um, it could bleed into others. So I'm actually going to remove that from the palette. So with cleaning palettes. I'm going to try something. I'm just going to take a razor blade and get it underneath there. There we go. Do I have a thing to put garbage in? I do. Not to say that white wash is garbage. Just um, you know, cleaning it up off of there. Anyway, with cleaning one of these type of palettes, I find that I could just um, take a little rag and scrub between and clean what I need. Or as you just saw, you could use the razor blade to scrape that area. You could also sit this, just sit water on top of it, and it'll um, dissolve everything and then you just rinse it off. That's if you want to do a total clean off. But the dried paints on here, they're really easy to reconstitute by um, just spritzing with a spray bottle. I don't have too many tools on my art desk or too many tools that I actually you know use all the time, but I found that a spray bottle is almost essential, whether it's for um, reconstituting the palette at the very beginning, just getting things wet, which makes it super easy, or um, maybe re-wetting areas of a paper. So I have not talked about the colors yet for today. Um, I'm thinking that we'll do an interior forest scene uh, interior, maybe winding water. Nothing too spectacular. I recently added uh, light red oxide onto the palette again to um, help compare to the Venetian red. So I'm going to use one or the other. Um, there's really not too much of a difference between the two, but you can see that this one is definitely more orangey. This was um, Van Gogh brand light red oxide. This was Da Vinci brand, Venetian red. Van Gogh brand is the student grade, but high quality, but they wouldn't have that diverse. I don't think they have the Venetian red yet. Um, this one is the more artist grade brand, and uh, they would have a light red oxide and a Venetian red. So it's kind of just a slight shift in color. I think those just come back, uh, stem back to them actually using you know, earth tones from those areas. And that would be from, uh, what, I guess the Venice area. Anyway, um, so we're gonna do an interior sky scene, uh, interior forest scene. The thought that comes immediately to mind, and I think this is why I said sky accidentally, is that I'm gonna leave the sky really light. Like, I'm really not gonna do much with it. I'm gonna take 
a little bit of raw sienna. Maybe put some down. Then a little bit of ultramarine. Put some down. And you know what? I think we're just going to leave it at that. I don't have the interior planned yet or anything like that to utilize highlights and whites to pop through. But um, I'm going to have it the lightest thing possible and then have a light potentially in a watery area. In fact, let me um, say our far horizon is going to be here. Our water path. Let's just do right through here. I think we'll do that. Okay. So um, that right there was kind of just the compositional, the thoughts taking place. This is raw sienna again. This is to um, kind of put in the idea of where the ground is going to be, leaving that empty space for where the water will be. Use the binder clips to flatten it so I don't pre-stretch or anything like that. Now here, um, I like to take a variety of earth tones as well as the blues, the darks, to kind of feed in and make um, interesting wet and wet within the ground. We'll just have this duck right in front. This comes up and back here. You can take the burnt umber and feed that into spots as well. I'm going kind of quick with this one, but I'm just, um, I feel the idea of just putting those in is more important than actual um, perfect placement. things like um, Payne's Gray, I'll say it over and over again, I really like putting that in wet and wet as the edge below the land along the water. That is just like my, one of my favorite uses for Payne's Gray. I do find that I have to apply it a few times potentially throughout it and kind of play around with it or darken it up in this instance but I um, I really love that I love that paint for that purpose now I'm thinking about how I want to approach the uh, the trees you know we're doing an interior forest scene so I was thinking let me get I'm sorry I have to get up for a second to get um shop rag I had um, been working on something in the living room and one of my hobbies is picking up um, derelict fountain pens off of um, eBay or online or at, you know, if I could find them in uh, antique shops, you know, for super cheap, and then restoring them, or at least attempting to restore them. And uh, I use, you know, the shop rags to clean and get ink and all that. Anyway, I'm going to refer back mentally to a picture that Miss Margaret had sent me and had me, um, you know, do a painting of. And ultimately, um, you know, I sent it off to her. It wasn't the plan, but um, she had liked. She, she had wanted to see my approach to it and whatnot. And in the far distance, there was um, some, um, a line of trees. And I approached that by just taking a raw sienna. So this is a stronger raw sienna composition. And there was a far line of trees and. The way I approached those guys was literally just putting in a wall 
of raw sienna. Now I'm gonna vary the height of this and how much of it shows through in the final painting, um, we'll see. I am going to mix some ultramarine in there. Ultramarine with raw sienna, I don't know how to describe the color, if it's like kind of a grayed down. Uh, raw sienna, or a dirtied, muddied raw sienna. And that gives us a little bit more variety back here. Now, of course, that back layer dries light, so we could put it in um, in darker quantities. So we can get a little bit more variety as we come forward. And here I could see that I'm incidentally, this, this is, was unplanned, a bend taking place. And I come, I'm liking that. I wasn't going to have such a drastic bend right there, but I am liking that shape that's happening. So I'm going to accentuate that and hopefully I'll be capable of keeping that throughout this whole uh, piece. One thing you can do here, and I'll do it with a light red. Usually in a lot of the videos I use the um, the Venetian red for this. But this is light red and um, ultramarine. This mixes a purple, which has um, a recession to it. Feed that in here. It's a little ultramarine, a little bit more vibrant than the mixture that I get with the Venetian red. By the by the way, the ultramarine brand is um, the Da Vinci brand. I'm gonna mix a little bit of Payne's gray in here. Sienna. Everything's still wet and wet, so it all kind of diffused together. Okay, so now um, at this stage, I'm going to take the rigor brush. Uh, this is a size one um, black velvet, uh, silver black velvet. Get these from Amazon or Blick.com. And I started buying this brand for other brushes after I saw um, Mr. Rick recommending it. I am always oh, doing a disservice because I can't pronounce his last name, Rick S. Uh, he is a prominent YouTube painting uh, artist. He has a Facebook page, blah, Facebook page for. Um, you know, friends of the uh, YouTube channel and all that, where a lot of people post all their different paintings and communicate and talk. And either they post their own paintings or they post follow along paintings and whatnot. But it's a really great page, really active page, so I highly recommend it. Also, um, Mr. Rick has uh, classes that he does online. I'm not sure how much they cost, but I heard nothing but good feedback from them so he has free YouTube videos and then he has like um, these intensive courses that y'all can take which um, you know I have no affiliation with him I've never talked to him in person or via internet or anything like that but um, he, he just does a lot for the art community and whatnot so I wanted to um, let you all know that that's a uh, a viable option for people that are looking for courses courses okay. and actually that's probably a good time for me to do my spiel um, and this is just a mixture of um, ultramarine and burnt umber just kind of getting it dark 
and I'm just putting in some shadows and putting in uh, some background uh, trunks. Anyway, my spiel, I, uh, I have a lot of the free videos on YouTube. I have the Patreon account with some exclusive videos, but I prefer to keep everything um, kind of free for y'all if I can. And um, But I would like, you know, if you guys do have the opportunity um, to check me out on Patreon and just kind of maybe sign up and support me in some way. This allows me to um, you know, purchase more supplies and maintain all this stuff being, you know, more free for everybody. So if you have the opportunity, check it out. If not, it's all good. I'm not going to hold it against you. It's, it's totally fine. Now I put those guys in there. Mix in that same mixture. And I'm going to feed wet and wet. This is kind of just the illusion of foliage happening. It's light. Um, we're going to layer over this. We could, if we want, take raw sienna and put that in here to highlight some of these and catch that glow on the sky behind. But um, as I'm just working backward, back to front, I'm not quite sure how my next layer is going to overlap this one. Now, we could start doing dry, dry offs. Um, we can continue to work over these and get a softer effect as well while it's wet, but I would have to increase the pigment concentration. So that'll be one of our experiments for this one. We'll do another layer of trees, but we'll do a wet and um, wet over it. And we'll see how much it dries and how it diffuses and whatnot. Now, this is an imaginary scene. But what you want to keep in mind um, when doing this is where the bases of these trees start off from. I have a small gap here uh, with the co concept of land going back behind that tree line. Now I have another line of trees taking place. This gap is going to be a little bit bigger than the next tree line gap. It's going to be more spaced. So that's how the perspective is going to work through this and what you need to keep in mind. Here. I put it in with um, that other tree line just to add some variety. And also because that far distance will not um, have much, if anything, of a shift downward perspective wise. And I just want to get a good density taking place. And with these, um, the trunk motion can get a little tedious. So um, what you want to keep in mind is to go to the edge of the paper. Because you're, you're a fast and loose painter, you're, you're working through this, it's a little repetitive whenever you're doing uh, interior, especially if you're layering. So just make sure you go all the way to the edge. Um, even though it'll be covered with a mat. These guys also come up a little bit higher. That is one of the cats. Uh, you can start adding more variety at this level. Um, make sure you don't get too repetitive with it. If I branch off here, I don't want to branch off on the same spot in the next one. Uh, so I want variety with that. And in the background, I did a lot side by side. Here we can start changing up that repetition and having gaps and whatnot. And of course, we're going to have our shadows. So 
the shadows work around it in place. I'm going to work in this fashion to get a little bit of texture now since we're closer. We ground it, we have a little bit of shadow going, we might have to come back and uh, harp on that a little bit more. Now I can start looking at the edge, doing that. It's crazy, um, as a side note, uh, with the cats with like... I guess, you know, they, they're like, they cry for attention, uh, essentially. And it's weird how um, it, it, it mimics like a child crying. And I swear to you, it sounded one yesterday, uh, the, the cry noise sounded like it was saying mama. It was the, it's pretty creepy, but it was weird how um, they're capable of, doing those sounds and then I was told and I hadn't heard it yet that they do a um a chirping motion uh noise and the chirping noise is meant to mimic birds and try to bring birds down um I have the bearded dragon in the uh in the cage and it's in its uh vivarium I believe they call them and the um cat was apparently doing that noise. I know I wasn't there. I was told this, that I was doing the, the chirping motion to Naga, the bearded dragon, to try to bring her down, I guess. Which is weird. Uh, I'm going to mix a slight dark for a little bit of foliage on this layer. Uh, whenever I say slight darks, it's usually ultramarine and the burnt umber. And I'm just varying height and layers. Oh, today's Wednesday. I got to do my allergy shot. Thanks for reminding me, guys. All right, now we're getting closer to the front and we have to do a dry off. Um, we're gonna start putting in some really um, trees with a lot of expression in them. Some areas still wet. Um, there's some areas up on top still that wet. I might utilize that for a raw sienna, wet and wet, um, to get the glow and some foliage. So while I felt that being wet up here, I'm gonna start putting some of those in and see if they soften up. These are some spots where the edges of the trees are going to catch the glowing light behind it. Now this is relatively new uh, approach that I've been adding into um, my tree paintings lately. So you'll probably see that theme happening in, the most, in previous videos. So these are for some closer uh, tree structures. Now you can take the um, the rigger or the hake for these trucks uh, trunks. I'm gonna use the rigger on this uh, layer. I feel like I'm gonna have a slightly closer ones as well. 
So I'll use the rigger here and then we'll um, most likely use a hake for the, the super thicker ones. Now, like I said, the positioning is kind of important. I could put them in a straight line like I did these other ones, but uh, coming closer, you'll start seeing variety in their vertical uh, placement where they start. So I'm just putting some dots down. I'm also doing a random pattern to separate out um, just that as if all those trees were planted there perfectly. Okay, so you want variety in height and the width between them whenever you get closer because that's where your eye and in nature you'll start seeing that variation take place. So this is a dark uh, mixture, Payne's Gray, Ultramarine, um, Raw, Burn Umber, sorry. Once again, these guys are going to have to be um, grounded. And you can ground them with that color and add another like interesting layer to the ground itself. So I could add ridges, and those ridges would um, cast shadows. Or I can look at it as if it's a mound coming up. So start thinking about things in those fashions. This guy's off the page, but like I said, work to the edge of the page. And maybe a hint of him will show through in the mat, but it really does help create your whole scene and that illusion um, through looking at the master oil painters of landscape in the 1800s a lot of them had um, movement that was coming off from or going off of the um, the edge of the painting but inadvertently you don't want to lead the eye off the edge of the painting. And if these trunks stay wet and wet long enough, you can play around with feeding color into them. And you could have like one big mixture ready, but I think remixing it may help with um, slight varieties from tree to tree as well. So that might be something you want to keep in mind as opposed to having pre-mixed areas of paint. And like I said, ground them, add shadows, Shadows in general are going to, if you're looking straight on and our light's right here, the shadow's going to come down. And perspective-wise, as it goes out, the shadows are going to start taking that angle with them. I'm not doing uh, perfect angles, but, um, but that's what you want to keep in mind. If I had an object here, shadow would be straight down. Here, they start going out. I did not put any reflections in the water, which um, I had put the dark edge with that Payne's gray in the beginning. Um, sometimes I feed in shadows before I even paint the object. And other times I do not. Um, we're gonna have to get a lot of uh, wet in the side of this to kind of let it diffuse some We'll play around in the water more to see what we can do with it. Anyway, so like I said, you could feed different colors or different tones into these trees now. Add life to them, make them interesting. 
we might probably put some white gouache back on the palette, but in an area where it won't contaminate and use that to highlight some tree trunks. You could also, um, like I said, take lighter concentrations and sometimes raw sienna looks really nice with um, highlighting tree trunks. I'm taking just a lighter version of this mixture just to add variety down in here. And this variety is just meant to give the illusion of um, roughness of the ground and the shadows rising and falling over it. So there's really no rhyme or reason to where I'm putting these marks, just so I have a variety of marks. And as I put in the other trees on top of that, there'll be even more um, variety in the tone. So here's these trees. And I could take the hake. More dark, actually, let's get La Siena in there. Start emphasizing this more. So you saw how the other one kind of softened where it was still a little wet. Now we're getting more structure. An interesting color to also put into this spot would be um, the light red or the Venetian red. So I'm gonna use the light red since chances are that's what you guys probably have on your palette. It does have an orange ear tone. You can start building up some foliage down here, some bushes and whatnot. Now, as you get below this highlight area, you then start getting a darker color. Now, this is due to um, the thickness of the foliage and also how it's sitting below the, um, I don't know what they call it. They call it the crown of a tree, the, the top area. So I'm splatting in this fashion. I've found that you could see here you, you leave some whites through it I have been um, trying to get this to blend more and less light shining through to help create a denser body there so that's been my another personal experiment that I've been working with I do like to take the hake sideways and go up along these um, trunks as the idea of a uh, moss or ivy or something. I'm gonna have to squirt this to let it diffuse. And when you put the darks in, I try to Get the pattern random. Leave bird holes for light to shine through. Like, and I mean bird holes like bigger holes than than the small holes here. And I'm not getting super dark with my um, mix yet. Palette wise, I could this is where I could add phthalo blue to really um, get it dark. I could also use the indie blue, but I think, like I said, I want to kind of um, keep this palette minimal to what colors you most likely have. 
You probably do have a Thala Blue, though, but... Let's see. Okay, have Payne's Gray. So Payne's Gray. Give me some of that dark, dark. Um, at this step as well, you can add more branches, more interest. You can scrape out branches. Um, you can accentuate the right side or the left side to give it a little bit of roundness to them and the shadow. You can create the underbrush. There's a lot of things you can do and play around with at this stage. I am going to take a very light wash of um, raw sienna. And get that curve here. then come back in with an even lighter and see if we can get that curve that goes behind. I feel like it's important to connect that horizon back there. And create just like an inkling of a shadow or reflection. All right, so now, like I said, you can take the card and scrape some in here too. So just to show you what's possible. Let's do a dry off and now I'm gonna do my closest layer of um, trees. Hope somebody's in the, um, the chat. Use one of those small porcelain cups that for my whites and one for my blacks. Yeah. Um, You can use little cups like this for um, the white gouache, and that's probably what I'll do. Great idea. Um, I'll put the gouache in here so it doesn't contaminate my other colors. idea from so I film these live and people come in and this is a uh, regular coming in WV and he had said he puts his um his white and stuff in small porcelain cups and I have these that I got from the Asian market I get these for like about what 99 cents a dollar they also sell um pallets that are round with those petals coming off the side and you can use that as well it has its own ink wells in it and that'll help out and I think he said he got it from uh, Cheap Joe's Art or Dick Blick or uh, Jerry's Art Arama. You could find those things there as well. So now we're coming up to the front. So I'm going to want more of a chiseled effect on the edge. Um, let's see. Just trying to mix a big concentration of just a dark. So burnt, umber, Payne's gray, ultramarine, that's what I just do as a go-to dark. Uh, it's still kind of splayed right now. So I'm gonna wet the ends and I can uh, reshape it a little bit. So, I'm gonna have a tree come up off of that edge. Branch. 
branch off right there. It's going to have a super dark down here. He's casting his shadow. That gives an interesting effect over that white, but it'll dry. Um, while I'm putting this in, I'm putting it in. Here's a little Cajun slang for you. Uh, for thick, you often hear them say tick, tick, tick. You got that tick, tick branch in there. Uh, if I split this off, I have to be careful because I have a split down here. So you want to be careful with um, the repetition. I do have these two guys closing in. So that's where you can start thinking about compositional ideas, if it looks good or not, or if it pushes the eye into this hole right here. Um, scrape out rocks and different structures. You can also scrape out portions of the trunk and give texture into the trunk. Different ways you can scrape. We'll scrape a little bit in this guy too. And that'll add variety. When I think we're gonna put the uh, gouache on the edge of those. So that'll add variety rather than just having that straight white from the gouache. We'll have also have some highlights that we pulled out. I do want another tree structure right here. And these are super close to the foreground, so I'm making them quite big. You can make them thinner if you want. Oh, I, I don't know if I mentioned just so for anybody watching, anybody watches this on YouTube, wherever, feel free to uh, paint along and I would love to see y'all's results. Um, okay, so I'm just adding some texture down here, shadows. This guy is gonna have a shadow too. I'm gonna have to play around down there later on but we'll focus on the trees at the moment. Add a little texture. And like I said, we'll highlight some whites. We could also, just for you guys to see, uh, raw sienna adds an interesting highlight in trees. It is quite um, pigmented right there, so we'll see. Now these guys are going to have a lot of branches and you want to think about coming up and off. Um, you can skip lines, you can jump around and we're going to put foliage over them. Pop that off the edge. All right, let's see. Raw Sienna. This gives us foliage. See what else we got going on. Venetian red. Kind of mixed into that mud, so it's a little too muddy. I'll correct that. The light red, sorry.
Payne's Gray. Some of the super darks off of this one. Break up the monotony up here. Solidify some areas so that it's not white all throughout. Get this corner almost completely blackened, I think, kind of as a uh, framing device. So now everything's there. We can start playing around with um, our scraping, our texture, lifting, whatnot, darkening up spots. I'm just playing around, having fun. These are just miscellaneous textures. Uh, we got our porcelain tray. Let's put our white gouache in it. That should be more than enough. And then I have a lamp black that I want to put in there. I'll just put it yeah, I have it on the palette. I'll just add it to the palette. So now we'll just play with black and whites, I think. And we'll see how we can get things accentuated. So here's some black. And you want to break up the monotony of your lines. You can put them in a lot of different ways. You can kind of side stroke them. You can put them in a straight line as if, if you want. But just um, add variation in texture and stroke and whatnot. Black is also a color that a lot of people shy away from in watercolors. And I think in, um, not they shy away so much in oil, but a lot of people will argue that it deadens the color that's there. And I don't know, while that may be true or not, I do like using black at times. And I do um, recall that, you know, up until the 1800s, and in the 1800s, they had black on their um, their palette, you know? Uh, the Zorn palette, which is an oil painting palette, four color minimum palette, um, a white, a black, a red, and like a yellow ochre or something like that. And black plays the part of blue in that palette. Which I've seen some people start experimenting with that palette with watercolor, but I don't know if they got much, very far with it. I think it might be Jane Blundell, who has a gouache um, experiment on her page. She has a lot of watercolor resources on hers. Um, she teaches, I don't know if she does online classes, I think she does in-person um, traveling lessons. But she's uh, very big on... Um, 
color studies and doing the swatches and whatnot and comparing brands. So that's a good resource too if you want to look into that type of stuff. We could come back in with more black in a moment, but I think it's now time to play with the gouache. Now gouache, I'll probably talk about it every every single time. Um, I believe the white pigment, you know, which I think, I think it was uh, originally chalk or zinc or something like that. I believe it came out around the 1800s and um and i talk about you know how like the art critics you know were, were telling people how to view things and a lot of people thought that uh the white gouache was against the the pure watercolors that it wasn't um part of the tradition and i think uh they were trying to maintain a separate separation of um, watercolor and oil painting. And I think gouache, the white paint, may have been one of the things that kind of bridged the gap, potentially. And maybe made people feel like they weren't working with pure watercolors. But um, it's totally fine if you want to use it. Just... Um, there's nowhere where traditions and ideas come from. So that's the black thing. Um, I try to put some calligraphy type strokes in and make things interesting. We'll see what happens with it when I dry off. But let's um, now go to the gouache. Actually, there's probably some areas that I could have darkened up too with that. We might do that in a moment. Anyway, so gouache. Let's see. Now, it is chalky, and it has a different effect than the white of the paper. So some people like it, some people don't. And uh, me and Joe Menza, uh, Joe Menza is um, another YouTube artist, and he follows the same um, approach that I take using that large hake brush. He has been using gouache as well. And I think we inadvertently made it our mission to um, try to end the stigma that is there in regards to uh, gouache. And one of the actual arguments you know, for it, um, you know, people will say is Turner used gouache. In fact, um, I think in the Victorian era, some people would coat the paper with a white wash before they started painting on it. I'm not sure why, I don't remember exactly, but I remember reading that somewhere. No, I'm just highlighting spots. Um, one of the things is, it does stand out differently than the rest of the painting, but I think um, with time, you know, finesse can be built with it. And a little goes a long way. If you are interested in gouache, uh, the white gouache, Mind of Watercolor has a video comparing different brands of gouache and their, um, their opacity and whatnot. I have a uh, DaVinci brand. I like DaVinci brand. I'm not like sponsored or affiliated with them in any way, but I, don't know, I like their prices. I like um, how easy it was for me to find light fastness charts off of some of their products and whatnot. And I think, you know, that's, uh, that's important for me. You should always have a towel nearby to pull stuff out.
if I had to compare it to anything, if you had a, um, a jelly roll pen, this is what a jelly roll pen is. It does look like you're drawn on it with a white jelly roll. Okay, let me uh, dry this off. We'll take a look, see what we want to do with it. Take a little bit of that black and stipple that in at some spots. I could cross this and have even another one breaking this up or coming over like that. Maybe I'll have it come over. Maybe that'll be interesting. We'll see how that works. So this is the experiment here, just a compositional. That's a little interesting. I could step in with that. that feel of one of those guys that fell over and kind of still grow a little bit. We could put some color in here if we wanted to. We could also experiment with wash if you want to on this guy.
Yeah, let's experiment a little bit of gouache on him. And uh, what else? Um, anything else we want to experiment with on this one? could put a dead branch right in here. Wash is nice for a dead branch. All right, so we got the dead branch, some pieces coming off of it. Then we could take like a burnt umber and feed it on the other side to start giving it that shape. And then we could take a black, put that in for the shadow right below it, and let it separate from the shadow to show that it rose in the air right there. Feed some black in if it's still wet. Unfortunately, that shadow led, led right into this guy. So, what we can do is take our white, kind of connect it and make that broken feel right here. Let's get dark dark. Dark dark. Third shadow. Okay, I think that's an interesting element right there. Um, we could take the Payne's Gray, accentuate this edge just because it's closer to us. But we should really be finishing this one up and calling it done. Kind of blend that dark into this, so attach them those two masses. All right, so we'll do a dry off, put a mat over, sign it, we'll call it a day. you all enjoyed and found this experiment interesting. Um, hopefully I'll be back on later today and make another video for you all. I'm not sure what I'm going to do this afternoon, whether it'll be ink, watercolor, or oil, or if it'll be a time lapse or a demonstration. But um, you can find all this 
at Andrew Broussard Watercolors on YouTube. I hope you all enjoyed. Here it is with a mat over it. Pretty fun interior scene. Uh, I encourage you all to um, experiment and have fun. All right, everybody, have a great day, and I'll talk to you all soon.